Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Battle channel. I have promised you a historical episode and this week I'm going to deliver. I'm going to talk about a man who did more than any other to shape modern Europe and also had profound effects on American history. More books have been written about him than probably any other person except of course Jesus. It is commonly thought that his great ambition was his way of compensating for his short stature. Though as we'll see, there's no evidence for this view. In fact, I'll wager that unless you're an avid history buff like myself, or possibly if you're French, almost everything you know about this man is wrong. The fellow in question is the first consul of the Republic and later emperor of the French, Napoleon Bonaparte. He was born as Napoleone de Bonaparte on the 15th of August, 1769, on the island of Corsica. This was ironically just three months after the fledgling Corsican Republic was conquered by France. His family was Italian nobility, and he grew up speaking Corsican, which is a lot closer to Italian. In fact, he never lost his Italian accent, even when he was emperor of the French. While attending school in France, he Frenchified his name to Napoleon Bonaparte, and he joined the French army, and in 1789, he became a supporter of the Revolution, which overthrew Louis XVI. He participated in some battles against the royalist forces, so this endeared him to the ruling committee, and he became one of their favorites, and later became a general. He rose to prominence in these wars against the other European powers who were trying to invade France and bring back a king because <laughs> they were very threatened by this idea of deposing and executing their royalty. In 1799, Napoleon was part of a coup that, that installed him as first consul of the French Republic, which is a very Roman title, which is no coincidence because he was a big fan of Roman history, in particular Julius Caesar. In 1804, he crowned himself emperor and reigned for 10 years until he was deposed in 1814. Now, it's a very short Cliff Notes version, uh, but that's the general story in case you didn't know that much about Napoleon. Now, much of the information in this video is from the excellent biography, Napoleon A. Life by Andrew Roberts, which was written and published in 2014 by Viking Press. Roberts is a popular historian in Britain and also a member of Parliament. This is a fascinating book with its only fault being it's really long. I mean, even at 135% speed, which is how I always listen, it was like 24 hours long. <laughs> My initial title for this video was going to be Napoleon in Fact and Fiction because as a steampunk, I love how we often fictionalize the lives of famous people like Queen Victoria or Nikola Tesla or Teddy Roosevelt. But there was very little fiction that did this with Napoleon. And I was inspired because he did appear in the historical fantasy series Temeraire by Nomi Novik, in which Napoleon gets to ride a flying dragon into battle, which is very cool. But this is one of the very rare books that fictionalizes Napoleon's life. It turns out, although there are hundreds of books that mention him and his Napoleonic Wars, uh, there are very few with him as a character. Uh, the author Shannon Selene is one of the rare exceptions, and she wrote a book called Napoleon in America, which I'll talk about in a bit. But her observation was that there were so many factual books about him that there was probably little reason to write a fiction starring him. Her book, Napoleon in America, has him being rescued from his exile on St. Helena by his brother, who did in real life live in America after, after a while. And he brings him to America where he says he's going to settle down and be a farmer, but of course he can't. He's going to involve himself in wars and revolutions. But before we get much into fiction, I'm going to talk about some of the misconceptions people have about this great man of history. So people think he was really short. I mean, I think he was quoted as being five foot two, but that's not true. That was a miscalculation of the units. 
In reality, he was five foot six, which wasn't that much below average. Average French man today is like five nine, so he he wasn't much shorter. In particular, like two hundred years ago, the average heights were shorter. There is no evidence for the famous Napoleon complex. I don't know who coined that term, <laughs> but it's bogus. This isn't mentioned in Robert's book, except there were a couple places where his troops would kid him, uh, which he took good-naturedly. So obviously it wasn't a sore spot uh, that, that he was a little short. It's not addressed in the famous Ridley Scott movie that came out in 2023. It's not addressed there either, uh, because... Nobody mentions him being short. I mean, Joaquin Phoenix plays Napoleon. He's 5'8", so a pretty good match in height. Now, people think of Napoleon as a tyrant who was only interested in self-glorification. In reality, he was immensely charismatic and popular with the people, in particular his troops, who basically went through hell for him, although he was always there with them. He was always at the battles. Uh, while on campaigns, he would talk with the lowliest of the soldiers, and if they were, you know, short, short rations, he would give them some of his. They would joke with him, and he'd joke back. His rule was certainly more egalitarian than his predecessors of the Bourbon kings, like Louis the Sixteenth, and it was far less bloody than the final days of the Revolution, the Reign of Terror, where they were guillotining people left and right. <clears throat> Among other things, Napoleon established religious tolerance in France and the other countries that he conquered, and he was a patron of the arts. He built great public works and commissioned a simplification of the legal system, which is the basis of law even today in many European countries and the state of Louisiana. He was ruled by his eco, people think, but in reality, he was very cool and calculating. I mean, he would occasionally throw a public fit of temper, but Roberts maintains that it was uh, intimidate people, that it was just for show, because he was always in control. He had a prodigious memory for names and faces. He'd remember people's names. He met them once 10 years ago, and he'd remember, oh yeah, how are your two daughters? And things like that. If one of his citizens was in dire straits, he would help them out. On the other hand, he was a notorious micromanager. He was interested in every detail of public administration, like, you know, street cleaning in Paris, <laughs> the sewage system in Nice, whatever, <laughs> anything like that. Another interesting tidbit, he was a workaholic who could get along in a couple hours of sleep at a time. He'd, you know, sleep, he'd get up, work some more, go back to sleep. He was fond of wine, but supposedly he never drank the brandy that was named after him. He was never known to be drunk. He's seen as a warmonger, but although he did fight a lot of wars, Napoleon was just as interested in other topics, such as legal reform, in science. He was a member of the Scientific Society, and he performed experiments and so on on his own, uh, and the arts. In fact, he wrote poetry and a novel in his early years. In the movie... As Joaquin Phoenix, he says, I never made war on anybody. They made war on me. <laughs> now, obviously, he was never hesitant to go to war. And in the beginning, those other countries were invading France. But later on, he would demand economic concessions from other countries. If they didn't cooperate, he would invade them. And often he would put a puppet on the throne like one of his brothers. <laughs> Sometimes he would change their system and, and make it more egalitarian, get rid of some of the aristocracy. Sometimes he'd leave it exactly as it was. Main thing was to benefit France. Another thing we see a lot about Napoleon was his love affair with his wife, Josephine, which is seen as one of the great romances of history. Not really. I mean, he was obsessed with her, yes, but both of them had multiple affairs. She was especially notorious in the early years of their marriage. And in fact, the minute he left for Egypt, she had this, this uh, young, handsome uh, aristocrat in her bed. And he always forgave her. The thing that aggravated him was when she wasn't discreet and it would show up in the British papers. That made him furious. So he actually left Egypt from his campaign and went back home to say, stop it. And he, of course, as a powerful man, and as they almost always did in that era, he had multiple mistresses. Now, he claimed to have only about 10, but in reality, he had like three times as many, according to Roberts. 
he especially loved princesses and actresses. And if he was uh, dating some starving actress when he was in Italy, for example, or in, in Austria or whatever, he would set them up in a nice apartment and make sure they were well provided for. And he did father some illegitimate children by some of them. He had amazing successes for a man who came from a relatively humble background. And that's because he was a genius. He was especially good at math. And that's why he became an artilleryman, because a lot of these soldiers, they couldn't figure out the trajectory of a cannonball. And he could. He could do these calculations in his head, <laughs> that sort of thing. So he was very smart. He read history all the time. He knew exactly all about the Roman campaigns, about Alexander the Great. That's how he was able to uh, formulate such amazing strategies to, to uh, achieve victory over his enemies. He had victory after victory, which really shows in the movie, in which one, one of my favorites was the Battle of Austerlitz, which is, was in Austria. And he kind of baited the enemy into attacking him over a frozen lake. Then, instead of a shooting the cannons at the troops, he shot them at the ice, which broke the ice, and a lot of them fell in and drowned, and their horses. And it was just amazing how they did that in the movie without, like, drowning any actual horses. <laughs> uh, so that was a great scene. His fatal mistake was to take on the Russians. He did not reckon on how tenaciously they would defend their homeland. Going so far as to burn all the crops, you know, and evacuate all the peasants, so they didn't have anything to live off of. And finally, even when he reached Moscow, they burned down the city to deny him that as a base. Now, that's a great scene in the movie, too. You see Moscow burning, and also a great scene in Tolstoy's book War and Peace, uh, which I particularly enjoyed, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, but because he dilly dallied too long and waited for the Russians to attack him, which they didn't, he finally had to leave Moscow. They were running out of food. And uh, this is where he lost tens of thousands of troops because they were starving. They were freezing to death. And they were catching diseases because it was the Russian winter, the severely cold winter. Even then, when he got back at, at, to France, even though it was a scandal, they didn't rise up and overthrow him. What happened was his army was so weakened that these enemies and other nations saw this as an opportunity to attack him and uh, depose him, and they did. They, they got him off the throne, and they exiled him to the island of Elba, a small island off the coast of Italy. And they said, here's an island of 10,000 people. You're the emperor of this island. <laughs> you can't leave. But, of course, he did escape, and he became emperor once again. <laughs> and there's a great scene in the movie where he's marching across a field with his partisans and encounters troops that are sent to stop him. And he bares his chest and he says, okay, shoot me dead. And somebody shouts, vive le empereur! And they all turn around and join him. <laughs> and they and he overthrows he overthrows the, the Bourbons once again and uh, becomes emperor for a short few months until being defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. Another great, powerful scene. You really get to see how military strategy was and how bloody everything was at that time. Now, I've been raving about this movie, and it truly was a really good movie. I was never bored, even though it was two and a half hours, more than that, almost three. And even Mrs. Desperado liked it, although she thought it was too long. Now, even Critical Drinker praised the movie. Uh, saying that it was simply too long and it covered too much turf. He should have just concentrated on the battles or concentrated on the relationship with Josephine or concentrated on the political maneuvering or whatnot. <clears throat> A lot of people also criticized Joaquin Phoenix's role as Napoleon, but I thought it was perfect. It was very understated, which kind of fits what I understand about Napoleon. He was a very calm and calculating person. And I also appreciate that he didn't do silly French accents. If it's not in French with subtitles, why bother? We have to imagine they're speaking French anyway. And the battle scenes are indeed superb. I also loved the women's costumes. In particular, Vanessa Kirby as Josephine uh, with the low bust line. She's showing like 49% of her breasts through most of the movie. And 
That's not something I would complain about, not at all. Of course, Napoleon and Napoleonic Wars figure into just about every book that's set in Europe in the early 1800s. Wikipedia lists over 70 of them, mostly novels. I haven't read that many of them, but three in particular stand out as great books, which I have read. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, and The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, who also wrote The Three Musketeers. Now, interesting thing was Dumas' father was the Haitian Creole general who served in both the Revolutionary Army and Napoleon's army. The music thing, though, is any of the British fiction of the era, he's invariably called the tyrant, the usurper, or bony, which is my favorite. Now, though we steampunks like our speculative fiction, where we fictionalize a particular historical character, there's very little of this with Napoleon, as I noted before. Napoleon America by Shannon Celine is one of the exceptions. Well, I really think it rings true according to what I've read about him. It very much sounded like what he would say and what he would do. There was the Temeraire series by Naomi Novik, which I also mentioned, starting with His Majesty's Dragon. And incidentally, the Dragon Temeraire was supposed to be a gift from the Chinese Emperor to Napoleon uh, as an egg, but was intercepted by the British Navy and that's where he became a military asset for the British. Another one is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, the great historical fantasy by Susanna Clarke, in which magic is real. And the two protagonists use magic to help defeat Napoleon, both in the campaign in Spain and the final battle of Waterloo. Both of these, of course, are from the British side. So it's the tyrant that you're super... <laughs> Now, a book I just heard about that I would like to read at some point was written by the former president of France, Valéry Gustave de Stang, and it's called La Victoire de la Grande Armée. It's a counterfactual history in which Napoleon doesn't make that big error of waiting for the Russians to attack him. He just leaves Moscow and later on can battle the Russians on his own terms. So he kind of <laughs> says, what would have, would have happened if Napoleon had screwed up at that point? So he's an actual character in that one, too. Napoleon himself was a writer. He wrote a lot of poetry when he was a young man. He also wrote a, a novella called Clisson de Genie. It was a romantic novella about a soldier and his lover, widely acknowledged to be a fictionalized version of his own relationship with teenage Eugenie Desiree Clary. And at the time, you know, it was pretty normal for, you know, a 20 year old to be dallying with like a 14 or 15 year old just considered pretty normal acceptable napoleon was definitely one of history's most influential people therefore of course he appears in fiction and some of the factual stories of his life are very fascinating because he was a fascinating character i hope you'll learn more about napoleon because it's important to learn about our history especially the history of the west and europe and america this has been my summary of the life of Napoleon as told in Andrew Roberts' biography, also the movie by Ridley Scott, and a handful of fictional books that involve or mention Napoleon. Let me know what you think about this in the comments below and give me any suggestions you might have. Please also like and subscribe so we can help get out the good steampunk slash historical fiction word. Also, check out my books on Amazon. As always, there will, I will have the links in the description. While I'm at it, I want to give a preview of a coming attraction. One of my next videos is going to be about the series Steam Cap by J.T. Murphy. It's a steampunk adventure uh, taking place in the early 1900s in the tradition of the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, but this time it's happening in America. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.